Hi, I'm Andrew Torgett with Texas History for Teachers. Joe is best known as the survivor of the Alamo, but his story gives us a window into a much bigger and a much more complicated story about slavery in Texas at the time of the revolution. Joe was born, as best we can tell, around 1815, 1816, into slavery in the American South. And at the time Joe was born, slavery was expanding rapidly in the United States. Uh, there was something called the Cotton Revolution as cotton prices start going higher and higher every year. It was feeling this movement of slaveholders and enslaved people into places like Mississippi, Alabama, and Louisiana. And some of those slaveholders went further west and went into the Mexican province of Texas. And this put them into a lot of conflicts with Mexico because Mexicans at the national level and, and many at the state level wanted to outlaw slavery. And so by the time you get to the early 1830s, it was illegal to bring any more slaves into Mexico. Some farmers coming from the United States still did. They just called the slaves contracted laborers and they forced them to sign 99 year service contracts, which was really slavery, but they called it something else. That's how Joe gets to Texas. He's brought into Texas between 1832 and 1833 by a man named Isaac Mansfield. And he's brought in illegally. And Mansfield had one of those kind of fake contracts for 99 years that said that Joe was a contracted laborer. But he was a slave. And, and we know this because he was bought and sold and treated as a slave. He ran away. He was captured by the, uh, the county sheriff. He was sold at public auction. And then in early 1835, he was purchased by a man named William Barrett Travis. Now, Travis was a leader of the Texas Revolution. He was one of the people kind of at the forefront of pushing a fight with Mexico. And for that reason, when the revolution gets going in the fall of 1835 with the Battle of Gonzales and everything after that, Joe is really swept up in the entire revolution. Um, Travis is sent out to San Antonio in early 1836 to be the commander of some of the forces out there that will later take on the Alamo. Joe, for the next 13 days, he really has a, a front row seat to the entire siege of the Alamo. He's there with Travis in Travis's headquarters and presumably in meetings that Travis had with the men and saw all this stuff, whether he wanted to or not, up close and personal. For the same reasons, Joe experienced all the terrors and, and fears that came with being inside the Alamo complex during those 13 days. And so he's there on the morning of March 6, 1836, when Santa Ana's army makes the, the final assault on the Alamo complex. And this happens in the pre-dawn darkness, around 5.30 in the morning or so. And pretty much all the Alamo defenders were asleep at the moment of the attack, including Travis, and Joe, who were in Travis's headquarters along the Western Wall. But what happened was, as Santa Ana's army comes charging up to the Alamo, a man runs into uh, Travis's room and screams that they're coming in. And so Travis jumps up, grabs his shotgun, and then yells over to Joe to grab a rifle and then follow him. And then both of them come tearing out into the courtyard and up to the Northern Wall. Travis leans over the wall with his shotgun and fires both barrels down into the attacking troops and immediately is shot in the head and falls backwards. And it's not clear if he died immediately or soon thereafter, but Travis was now out of the fight. Joe, who's standing right there and saw all of that, has to make a choice of what he's going to do. And he decides to retreat back down to the room where he and Travis had been, and he barricades himself within that. And here is all the carnage and the fight that ensues after that. Joe later testifies that he stuck his rifle out the window a few times to fire at the Mexican troops, but Joe's trying to survive and it's unclear if he's going to be able to survive and make it through all this fighting. At the end of the fight, at the end of the slaughter, there's a Mexican officer who comes by the West Wall and then yells out in English, are there any Negroes here? And Joe decides this might be his moment to survive, and so he opens the door that he barricaded closed, pokes his head out and yells, here is one. At which point he is almost killed because a Mexican soldier who saw this pulled out his gun and started firing and then fired a, a ball that went right past his hip and grazed Joe. And then another Mexican soldier lunges at him with a bayonet and then grazes his other side. So Joe almost gets killed twice as soon as he pops his head out the door. The Mexican officer in charge pushes back the men, takes him into custody. And then the Mexican army uses Joe to identify the bodies of the commanders of the Alamo 
He identifies the body of William Barrett Travis. He also identifies the body of James Bowie. But you can imagine what Joe was feeling at this moment. He has no idea if he's gonna live or if he's gonna die. And there were a handful of uh, Alamo survivors uh, from the Texas side who were executed at this moment by Santa Ana. Joe probably saw that. What ends up happening is he's brought back into San Antonio and then at some point, and it's unclear how or why, he leaves. It's not clear if he escaped, it's not clear if he was sent away, but he starts making his way east and making his way towards Gonzales. Along the way, he runs into a woman named Susanna Dickinson, who would also survive the Alamo siege. He and Susanna make their way to Gonzales, where they encounter Sam Houston, who is in charge of all the Texan forces. And Houston hears about the fall of the Alamo from Joe and Susanna, and he decides that the only thing he can do is to burn down Gonzales and retreat with his army east to train it and build it, hopefully to be able to survive a fight with Santa Ana. They made their way east, following the Texas army to the Brazos River, where they stopped at the plantation of the biggest slave owner in Texas, a man named Jared Gross, where Sam Houston was training his army, getting it ready for a fight, and the Texas government had come in order to set up shop. And it's at um, Jared Gross's plantation that Joe gets to really tell his story in full. The Texas army is there, the Texas government is there, and they sit him down and they interview him. And there was a man there named William Fairfax Gray from Virginia who recorded uh, a version of what Joe had to say about the Alamo fight. And it's one of our earliest insights into what the actual fighting was at the last day of the, of the Alamo siege. He said, the servant of the late lamented Travis, Joe, a black boy of about 21 or 22 years of age is now here. He means at Jared Gross's plantation. He was in the Alamo when the fatal attack was made. He's the only male of all who were in the fort who escaped death. And he, according to his own account, escaped narrowly. I heard him interrogated in the presence of the cabinet, that's the government of Texas, and others. And he related the affair with much modesty, apparent candor, and remarkably distinctly. Joe gave his account of what happened uh, at the Alamo and then from there, Sam Houston's army goes on to a miraculous victory at San Jacinto on April 21st, 1836, and winning independence for Texas. But Joe doesn't get his independence, and Joe doesn't get freedom either. He's still considered a slave of the estate of his former master. And so he is sent to work for a man named John Jones, who is in charge of Travis's estate. And Jones puts him to work for anybody who's willing to pay for him to do whatever work would be available. And so Joe from April 1836 to April 1837 is working again as a slave. And then on April 21st, 1837, exactly one year after the victory at, at the Battle of San Jacinto, Joe decides that it's time for his own independence and his own freedom. And he runs away. We know this because John Jones then put an ad in the Texas newspapers trying to find him that gives us a lot of details about Joe and is sort of this final chapter in Joe finding his own freedom and liberty. Jones puts this ad in the newspaper that says, on the night of the 21st of April, a Negro man named Joe belonging to the succession of the late William Barrett Travis, who took with him a Mexican and two horses, saddles and bridles. Apparently Joe ran away with a Mexican POW from Santa Ana's army and took uh, a horse with him, or two horses. He is about 25 years of age, five feet 10 or 11 inches high, very black and good countenance. Joe was never caught. Joe was never brought back. And so Joe found whatever liberty and freedom that he managed to find by escaping um, that. But his story is important. And it's important for us to understand because it reminds us that the Texas Revolution did not bring freedom for everyone. And that slavery was a defining problem that Texas would struggle with until the end of the American Civil War.